So in our first two parts, we discussed the mysterious House Merriweather, and based on some evidence, we put forward that Orton and Tana Merriweather appear to be working against House Lannister and for the Aegon cause. Most notably, Orton Merriweather downplayed news of the Golden Company on Cersei's small council, and Tana Merriweather knew about a golden coin in Rugen the Jailer's cell, which appears to have been planted by Varys. However, in our analysis of Cersei's small council, we were also struck by something very odd. For some reason, Orton Merriweather supports a Greyjoy alliance, something that Paxter Redwine also previously supported as the Greyjoy fleet would augment his fleet in its assault on Dragonstone. And when Cersei left her small council, Tana gives her news that the Redwine twins are in love with Marjorie. It is quite peculiar, and we should keep in mind that Tana's mention of the Redwine twins is the thing that sparks Cersei's whole idea of framing Marjorie for infidelity. So what on earth is the Merryweather interest in House Redwine? Well, let's take a detour away from the Merryweathers and talk about House Redwine and their impact on the story. So the Redwines are introduced very early in A Game of Thrones in Daenerys 1 among lords that Viserys thinks will rise for him. The realm will rise for its rightful king. Tyrell, Redwine, Derry, Greyjoy, they have no more love for the usurper than I do. The Dornish men burn to avenge Elia and her children and the small folk will be with us. They cry out for their king. He looked at Illyrio anxiously. They do, don't they? Now, we aren't sure how Viserys comes to this assessment. Perhaps it's his own analysis based on history, or perhaps Illyrio is feeding him these opinions. Regardless, Viserys is at least partially right in his assessment of support. The Darys were secret Targaryen supporters. The small folk do speak well of the Targaryens on occasion and the Dornish are at least claiming to support Targaryens, and Jon Khan looks to them for support. That said, Viserys' assessment of the Greyjoys appears to be off. They want independence, not to bend their knees to a Targaryen. And the Tyrells? Well, in A Game of Thrones, Varys speaks of Loras scheming to make Marjorie Robert's queen, and the Golden Company later sees the Tyrells as enemies now that they have joined with the Lannisters. So it seems Viserys has overstated the support of the Tyrells. Which leaves us with the Red Wines. Who would they support? Well, after Viserys' assessment, we next hear of House Redwine in tandem with House Tyrell when Eddard thinks of their role in Robert's Rebellion. And this pairing of Tyrell and Redwine is a fairly common occurrence throughout our story. And this linking by our characters seems to be justified. Redwine and Tyrell are connected through two marriages. Paxter Redwine and Mace Tyrell are in fact cousins and brothers-in-law. Olena Redwine is Mace Tyrell's mother and Paxter Redwine's aunt, and Paxter Redwine is married to Mace Tyrell's sister, Mina. On top of this, the two men, Mace and Paxter, are described as old friends. And so one would think, where Tyrell leads, Redwine would follow. And so if Varys worries about the scheming of Loras, and the Golden Company thinks Mace Tyrell an enemy, the Red Wines would be hostile as well. Wouldn't they? Well, this brings us to the third thing we learn about House Redwine in A Game of Thrones. Paxter Redwine has children, Horus and Haber, twins. And with that, we appear to have a problem. A twin problem. You see, in a feudalistic system, the eldest male is the heir a situation that no doubt leads to animosity and disputes from younger siblings who do not inherit. It's a bad situation to start with, but what does one do under feudalism when the children are the same age? Is the first one out of the womb simply the heir? Perhaps, though it should be noted that during our own Middle Ages, twins sometimes split lands, and sometimes the second twin was thought to be older due to weird ideas about the order of conception. Barcelona even had co-twin rulers once. Our own world had no hard and fast rule on what to do with twins. Also, during birthing, would the maester mark the firstborn? What if there was a mix-up? By the way, with nearly every case of twins in our story, there is trouble differentiating them. Jamie and Cersei pass for each other. The Drinkwater twins pass for each other. Olena's guards, Eric and Arik, pass for each other. Arya and Rayla Targaryen pass for each other. And yes, Horus and Haber Redwine pass for each other. But even if the twins are differentiated and one is declared the heir, sibling bitterness over inheritance is incredibly common in our story. It's a huge part of the Ariana story, Theon's story, Jon's story, Cersei's story, Tyrion's story, Danny's story, and Sam's story. Wouldn't a twin feel especially disenfranchised? Losing inheritance and power by mere minutes? 
Now with regards to the twin problem, it's rather striking that at no point in our story is the heir to the arbor ever revealed to us, whether it be Horus or Haber. Appendices usually let us know if someone is an heir, but the appendix for a Game of Thrones doesn't list either twin as heir. The appendix for a Clash of Kings doesn't either. The same for the appendix of A Storm of Swords, A Feast for Crows, and A Dance with Dragons. And no character ever refers to either twin as heir in the text. Horus is usually listed first, it's true, and he was kept longer as a hostage than Haber in A Clash of Kings, but that's the only evidence we have on the matter. For all we know, Paxter has kept the heir a secret for the twins' safety, and it isn't common knowledge. Or perhaps he hasn't decided which one is his heir. And even though Tana Merriweather's word can hardly be trusted, she does say that Horus and Haber argue over who will inherit the arbor. So it seems even the Redwine twins don't know for sure. Now, we are presented with a few solutions on what to do with extra non-inheriting children. There's joining the Night's Watch, the Faith, the Citadel, or the Kingsguard. However, each of these four options is not great, as they all involve celibacy and passing up having a family. The better option for a parent is to find the child a good marriage or to find them some lands to take over. We, for example, can look at the actions of Mace Tyrell. Willis is his heir, and so he has Loris join the Rainbow Guard and then the Kingsguard, he has Marjorie married off to Kings, Renly, Joffrey, and Tommen, and with Garlin, he has him given Brightwater Keep. All of Mace Tyrell's children have a place to live and a secure future. And so with Paxter Redwine, we should see similar actions. He has three children, Horus, Haber, and Desmera. What has he done to solve the twin problem and secure a future for his non-inheriting children? Well, we certainly hear of Paxter trying to find a match for his daughter Desmera. We find out that there was consideration of a marriage to Sam Tarly and consideration of a marriage to Davin Lannister. But with Horus and Haber, we get nothing. Tywin considers marrying Cersei to one of them, but from Paxter, we weirdly find no action. And the situation is actually much more puzzling. After the Blackwater, Reacher lords are given the spoils of war for rescuing the Lannisters from Stannis. The Tyrells take the Florence Brightwater Keep and give it to Garland and lesser tracts of land are then given to Rowan, Tarly, Oakheart, Hightower, and even some houses who are not present. Redwine, though, asks for no lands, but instead for a 30-year break in duties on certain premium wines. It makes absolutely no sense. House Redwine holds the largest fleet in the kingdom. They are tight with the Tyrells and are actually the only Reacher lords to stay loyal to the Lannisters in the war because the twins were kept hostage. Horus Redwine even receives a wound fighting at the Battle of the Blackwater, and yet the Redwines only get a tax break on some wines and a temporary one at that. House Hightower didn't even send forces and they got lands. This was the perfect opportunity for Paxter Redwine to resolve his twin problem. A keep in lands could have easily been found for either Haber or Horus. After all, after the Blackwater, Brightwater Keep, Harrenhal, Derry, Storm's End, Night Song, and Dragonstone all lacked recognized lords. And that's just to name a few. We are specifically told that there are plenty of lands. 47 Stannis-supporting lords lost their lives at the Blackwater, and their heirs were disinherited. And even if there were no lands at that moment, there's the promise of future lands in the Riverlands or the North after the defeat of Rob. This was done with Lothar Brun. Or failing any of that, a good marriage could have been brokered. But no, we get no attempt to resolve the twin problem at all. And it's at this point that we find that the coupling of Tyrell and Redwine that we hear so much of in our story is perhaps a false coupling. They are not peas in a pod. One house is greatly benefiting from the Lannister-Tyrell alliance, while the other, for whatever reason, is not. And on top of this difference in benefits, Redwine and Tyrell have had a different history in our story. So I briefly mentioned that Horus and Haber were made hostages by the crown. This happens after they curiously did not leave King's Landing with Renly and Loras in A Game of Thrones, and so near the beginning of A Clash of Kings, Varys reports to Tyrion that the twins want to escape on a Pentashi trading galley. Now, this is Varys, so we have no idea how much of this story is true and how much is fabrication. Did the twins really want to escape King's Landing? Was there ever a Pentashi trading galley? If there was, was it one of Illyria's Pentashi trading galleys? Did Varys set up the twins only to have them fail? 
Regardless, it's because of Varys, an agent of the Aegon cause, that the Redwine twins are kept from leaving and remain bargaining chips. And as a result, Paxter Redwine is unable to declare for Renly and provide him a massive fleet to win the war. So, as we can see, it's not just Tana and Orton Merriweather who have an interest in the Red Wines. The Aegon cause has been focused on them from the beginning. We see it with Viserys, and we see it with Varys. And we even see it with Illyrio. At the beginning of A Dance with Dragons, while exploring Illyrio's manse, Tyrion stumbles upon a cask of strong wine marked as the private stock of Lord Runkeford Redwine, the grandfather of Paxter Redwine. How Illyrio came into possession of personal wine from House Redwine remains a mystery. Now, an Aegon Cause interest in the Redwines is all well and good, but it's hardly a surprise. The Aegon Cause would want the Redwines to join them. Who wouldn't? The Redwines have a massive fleet. But do we have any evidence that the Redwines would actually be open to joining the Aegon Cause? Well, in the John Con chapters of A Dance with Dragons, Halden Halfmaester speaks of potential friends that the Aegon Cause may have, and John Con sends out letters to likely friends of the Cause in the Stormlands, Reach, and Dorne. These unnamed allies are sometimes referred to by fans as the Golden Company's Friends in the Reach. But one thing that is often overlooked when people discuss the Friends in the Reach line is that when it's originally spoken, it's not the Golden Company's Friends in the Reach, it's referring to the Friends in the Reach of Laswell Peak, and specifically Laswell Peak's friends from a hundred years ago. And this gets us into our discussion of the Blackfires, that is, Damon Blackfire, his descendants, and those who support their claim to the Iron Throne. When Laswell Peak speaks of events a hundred years ago, he is almost certainly speaking of the Blackfire Rebellions. Laswell Peak's ancestor, Gorman Peak, was the Lord of Three Castles, but then supported Damon Blackfire during the first Blackfire Rebellion and was stripped of two of them as punishment. Gorman Peak was then caught conspiring to start a second Blackfire Rebellion and was executed for it. We aren't sure what happened to the rest of the Peaks after the death of Gorman, but Laswell Peak is listed as an exile lord, even though there is a Titus Peak who is the current lord of Starpike. It seems that after the second Blackfire Rebellion, Gorman Peak's heir was exiled and Starpike, the last castle, was given to a different Peak line. Whatever the case, when Laswell Peak speaks of his friends, he's likely speaking of Blackfire supporting houses. Now, Aegon may or may not be the son of Rhaegar, and may or may not be a Blackfire, or may or may not be a random nobody. We don't know. What we know is that Laswell Peak feels confident that he can get his friends to join him. Friends who are almost certainly houses that either supported the Black Dragon and the Blackfire Rebellions, or at least considered it. So, the big question is, was House Redwine a Blackfire supporter? Well, at no point in our story do we hear about who the Redwine sided with in the Blackfire Rebellions. Even in the Fifth Rebellion, the War of the Nine Penny Kings, which included many sea battles, we only hear about Greyjoys sending ships to aid the fight. We hear nothing of the Redwines. But I will say that the Blackfire supporters are not a uniform bunch. In the Mystery Night, Gorman Peak tells us who he's trying to recruit to the Second Rebellion. Most of these invited here fought for the Black Dragon once. The rest have reason to resent Bloodraven's rule. Or nurse grievances and ambitions of their own. So, we have three types of Blackfire supporters. We have the true diehards for the Black Dragon. Then we have those who hate Bloodraven. And then there's just the opportunists those who would be perfectly fine with Blackfire rule as long as it benefited them. Now, the fact that House Redwine still has the arbor and is a very well-to-do house tells us that they were not an open, die-hard Blackfire supporter. However, there's a chance that they were waiting in the wings, keeping communication open with both sides, and seeing who would end up on top. A big part of the Mystery Night and the story of the Second Blackfire Rebellion is the opportunism of House Frey. Gorman Peak uses a Butterwell Frey wedding as an event to bring together potential Blackfire supporters to conspire. Lord Frey considers his options, assesses the chance of Daemon Blackfire II, and makes it look like he's on board with the whole conspiracy. But in the end, it appears that Lord Frey was conspiring with Bloodraven as well. At the end of the story, he drinks wine comfortably with Bloodraven, in contrast to Lord Butterwell, who was on his knees. And Lord Frey was not punished for the conspiracy, as far as we know. The Freys appeared to be playing both sides, much like they did during Robert's Rebellion and the War of the Five Kings. So, are the Redwines like the Freys? Are they opportunists? 
Well, as I said, we hear nothing of them sending forces to either side in any of the five Blackfire rebellions, even in the War of the Nine Penny Kings. And we know this waiting, opportunistic, playing both sides strategy was used by major Reacher houses, including House Hightower and House Oakheart, at least in the first Blackfire Rebellion. And this does bring us to the final thing we learn about the Red Wines in A Game of Thrones. We learn of a potential marriage for the Blackfish. I told him, commanded him, marry. I was his lord, he knows, my rights to make his match. A good match, a red wine, old house, sweet girl, pretty, freckles, Bethany, yes. Poor child, still waiting, yes, still. Bethany Redwine wed Lord Rowan years ago, Catalan reminded him. She has three children by him. Even so, Lord Hoster muttered, even so, spit on the girl, the Redwines, spit on me, his lord, his brother, that blackfish. I had other offers, Lord Bracken's girl, Walder Frey, any of three, he said. Has he wed? Anyone? Anyone. So, we find that the Blackfish defied his lord and brother by refusing to marry a red wine. In fact, by the way Hoster describes the event, it appears Blackfish quite vehemently rejected the idea. And on top of this, he rejected the idea of marrying a Bracken or a Frey. And this refusal to marry leads to a lifelong feud between the brothers. Now, some theorize that the Blackfish didn't marry because he's secretly gay. But we should remember that this is feudalism, where marriage is not done for love, but for political purposes. After all, Renly married. So, what on earth was Blackfish's problem? Why did he refuse the Redwine, the Bracken, and the Frey? Why did he refuse to be politically joined with these houses? Now, this feud predates Robert's Rebellion, going back before Catalan can even remember, which would be about 268 after Conquest, or so. So any political reason for the rejection would have to be based on Blackfish's early life, of which we know little. But what we do know is that Brynden Tully is likely named for Brynden Rivers, that is, for Bloodraven, an ardent opponent of Blackfires. And we know that Blackfish squired for Lord Derry, a Targaryen loyalist and ardent opponent of Blackfires. And we know that the Blackfish fought in the War of the Nine Penny Kings against Blackfires. And this may help explain Blackfish's rejection of the brides presented to him. House Bracken is the House of Bittersteel, and the Brackens were supposedly going to aid the Blackfires in the First Rebellion, but were delayed by storms. And the Brackens were seen as likely supporters in the Second Rebellion before the conspiracy fell apart. As for House Frey, again, they did seem to be playing both sides in the Second Rebellion. The conspiracy used a Butterwell Frey wedding as an excuse to gather Blackfire supporters. Even though Lord Frey did work out an agreement with Bloodraven, he can hardly be seen as trustworthy. Which brings us to the Red Wines. As I said before, we don't know who they supported in the rebellions, if anyone. And despite the War of the Nine Penny Kings having sea battles, we hear nothing of the Red Wines. And so the Blackfish, a man named after a Blackfire hater who squired for a Blackfire hater who then fought against Blackfires, may have seen the Red Wines as insufficiently loyal or untrustworthy. They are, after all, in bad company with House Bracken and House Frey. And so let's review the four things that we learned about House Redwine in A Game of Thrones. They are a house that Varys and Illyrio think may side with them. They are a house that is tied with the Tyrells, they are a house with a succession issue, the twin problem, and they are a house that the Blackfish, for whatever reason, wants nothing to do with. Now, let's put all of this information together and suppose for a moment that the Red Wines are opportunists and perhaps open to the Aegon cause. Again, we should remember that the Red Wines and the Tyrells are linked through marriage. Paxter is married to Mace Tyrell's sister, Mina Tyrell, which means if Mace Tyrell's line is killed, or disinherited, Highgarden falls to Mina Tyrell, Paxter Redwine's wife, which means the heir becomes either Haber or Horace. And suddenly, we have a solution to the twin problem. One would inherit the arbor, with the other inheriting Highgarden. And so we can see the Redwine's heavy Tyrell ties are actually a double-edged sword. Yes, the families are entwined, and so one would expect loyalty, but at the same time, the incentive for betrayal is extremely high. 
and this all helps explain why the red wines chose not to solve the twin problem after the black water. They had their sights set higher, on a prize as great as the arbor, on Highgarden itself. And so, based on the Aegon cause's heavy interest in the red wines, the red wines' apparent history of at least not being loyalist throughout the Blackfire rebellions and the Blackfish's dislike for them, and the heavy incentive for betrayal to solve the twin problem, I put forward that yes, in fact, the red wines are likely to side with the Aegon cause. They are friends in the Reach. And accepting this, we can return to the Meriwether's story and the rest of Tana and Orton's actions throughout A Feast for Crows. And that's what we'll do next time in part four. Thanks for watching, and we'll see you next time.